Greetings from the Asian Productivity Organization. Welcome to all viewers today APO Productivity Talk on Intelligent Automation in the Service Sector. Many companies and organizations had already been trying to accelerate their digital transformation before the COVID-19 pandemic made it a necessity. The pandemic has also sped up the service revolution and the adoption of intelligent automation and service robots by many companies. To give us a good understanding of this topic, we invited Dr. Jochen Wiltz, Professor of Marketing and Vice Dean of MBA programs at the National University of Singapore Business School to give today's P-Talk. Jochen Wiltz is a Vice Dean of MBA programs and Professor of Marketing at the NUS Business School, National University of Singapore. Professor Jochen is a leading authority on service marketing and management. His research has been published in over 1,200 publications, including six features in the Herbert Business Review. He has written over 20 bestsellers with intelligent automation, staying on Amazon's bestseller list for more than eight months. His publication has become global service marketing textbooks with combined sales of over 1 million copies. In recognition of his excellence in research and teaching, Professor Jochen has received over 50 awards, including the prestigious Christopher Lovelock Career Contribution to the Service Discipline Award of the American Marketing Association, Academy of Marketing Science Outstanding Marketing Teacher Award, and the Outstanding Educator Award from the NUS. Hello, Professor Jochen, and thank you very much for giving us valuable time today. The floor is yours. Hello, Mayu-san. It's a great pleasure to be here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Mayu-san. I'm so delighted to be with all of you here today uh, and to really share a research area I'm absolutely passionate about, and that's really intelligent automation and AI and service robotics in the service sector. And why I'm so excited about it is that, look, we had the agricultural automation, we had the industrial automation, and they have given us high quality food, high quality manufactured goods at lower and lower costs so that we can give food and goods to the masses. And what's, what's happening right now is exactly the same for the service sector. Service sector hasn't been growing in productivity very much. You look at a haircut 100 years ago to a haircut today, uh, the productivity hasn't increased very much, uh, even restaurants and so on. It's, it's very incremental productivity increases. But that is about to change right now. And why? Because I believe everything is coming together right now. So all of the technology that touches the service sector here is getting better cheaper, faster, more powerful, almost by the month. So we're talking about drones, we're talking about robotics, we're talking about cloud technologies, mobile, uh, biometrics, natural language processing, machine learning, and you name it. And this will really revolutionize the service sector where we will get high quality services at low cost. And there is a virtual insatiable demand for services such as education, healthcare, but people just can't afford it. And that's gonna change here. So industry by industry will be, if you will, industrialized here in the service sector. And I will share my views on this. And I promise you in five years from now, at least the guys will go to a hairdresser and the hairdresser will have a smart mirror. You look into the mirror, the AI will do an analysis of your head shape of, of the hair and what, what could be done with your hair and then superimpose on this mirror. And then you find the cut you like and you press go and it will be done by a robot. Yeah, these, these things will, will come. Uh, same, I mean, uh, Japan is leading in, in healthcare using robotics and also in restaurants, sushi restaurants and so on using robotics. And that will just move so very fast. Now, before I go, let me just share some pictures of what the service sector very often looks like today. 
And here, I call this awful pictures we don't want to see anymore. And you can see here, these are real photos taken by my co-author on this book, Intelligent Automation by Pascal Bornet. He was the McKinsey director for AI and, and robotics in Asia and did many digital transformations here. And the top photo, what you see here, is really a bank queuing at a bank. The bottom is a rail station. I mean, this is terrible service. Customers are so unhappy, they're wasting their time. Yeah, and this is a real case. This is a very large uh, MNC, and this is the backroom processing of invoices. So they're paying people, they're paying claims, they're paying um, vendors and so on. Can you imagine uh, they process like 400,000 invoices a year? And this is what the office looks like. And Pascal went in here to, to, to sort of uh, um, completely clean this up and use inter intelligent automation. It was over 40 people in this office. Now it's, I think it's below five people. And 99% of all invoices are done by intelligent automation and only exceptions um, are used to, to uh, will be done by people. And then at the same time, they of course train the robots or the AI to also do those in the future. And so it's, it's terrible for customers, it's terrible for people. And then, of course, with COVID, we have seen the, the, the load on healthcare globally. People are burned out. So this is not that different to what we had in manufacturing when jobs and factories were horrible. I mean, yes, uh, there were sweatshops. Today, sweatshops are the call centers in, in the world. And uh, really intensely stressful frontline positions here and I believe that intelligent automation and service robots will really help us to address this and, and also make this type of work a lot more satisfying for, for people, so for, for employees and for customers alike. Now, intelligent automation is not one technology. It's not robots or something. It is really everything together. So you need computer vision. Why? Because you have biometrics, you have text recognition. So you, you, you need to have computers being able to see. So it's, that's vision. The second is execution. So you want to automate issuing of credit cards, issuing of travel insurances, account openings, and so on. So you do need smart workflow, robotic process automation, and those things. Because if a customer calls and talks to your digital agent, and then the digital Asian and the customer agree on, on a travel insurance, you have to execute that. So an email has to be sent, a policy has to be open. So this is the whole um, doing part, execution part of automation here. Then language, of course, I mean, the, the AI has to understand you, so there has to be natural language processing. And I mean, text works very well, but um, I promise you in a few years time, nobody types in anymore to a chatbot. It's just like you talk to Siri or to talk to a digital agent, you say, hey, uh, I'd like to open an account with you. you know? and, and the AI really has to understand this. And, and the last one is thinking and learning, right? That's analytics, that is machine learning. And you will see as we go through, through the presentation here, you need all of these four capabilities um, to industrialize the service sector. Now, there are really um, three dimensions here. So I want to go more specifically into service. And there are really three dimensions that determine whether or not a service can be fully automated using service robots, using AI, using intelligent automation. Yes. And the first one is really, is the task tangible or intangible? So do I move stuff and do things that are in the physical world or is it all in the digital world? Is it all digital information processing and so on? This is the first one. The second one is the purpose of the service. Is that cognitive and analytical? So I want a diagnosis. I want to have an investment advice. Or is it emotional and social, so I want to enjoy myself. I want to have a wonderful experience. Right? That, that's the second dimension. And the third one really is, how often does this process happen? And then each time it happens, how similar or dissimilar is it? Yeah. 
Uh, so these are the three dimensions. Let me just show you one by one how that affects whether or not you can automate that service. If the first one was, is that tangible or intangible? <laughs> yeah. And you can see at the top here of tangible action to people, to objects. So that is your tangible action is um, I cut your hair, um, you know, uh, I polish your nails or something. And to, to objects is your baggage, is your car. So it's, it's doing things to stuff you, you, that you have, right? So, and of course, for the physical world, the tangible actions, you need a tangible physical robot. There's somebody who carries your suitcase to your room, somebody, uh, some robot that delivers room service to your room. So I need a, a moving robot to do this. And this part is developing fast and, and you will see more and more hotels will have um, room service bots that deliver food. So it's moving fast, but not as fast as the other end, the intangible actions. So intangible actions, is anything where I don't have to touch and move anything. So whatever you can do on a website, on an app, whatever you can do on a call center, that is intangible. I don't touch physical stuff. And this is where the service revolution hits the fastest. So currently, the fastest shrinking job category in America is retail assistance. And why? E-commerce. Uh, Amazon and so on. Um, and then very often, even if you go into a shop and their assistance, very often, at least for me, I, I, I take out my smartphone, I do a quick Google search on reviews of products, on recommendations for products, on helping me to identify what is the right product. Often, Mr. Google is better than the shop assistant in the shop. So even within shops, we need less and less um, uh, assistance here because customers have the technology and so on to self-service. So the so the the, the fastest is retail assistance right now, uh, right now, but it, what is really accelerating is call centers, customer contact centers. Because whatever you do in the customer contact center can be delivered by a bot, by a digital agent, by a virtual agent, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I share a, a digital agent with you later in this presentation. So call center staff and call centers are the first that will go uh, and will be fully automated, will be fully scalable. And, and I mean, every call center transaction costs you between $5 to $20 US uh, for every interaction, right? If you, if you look, look at systems and staff and everything. And if you make that scalable and, and fully automate this, make this end-to-end -end automated processes, these costs can be brought down to a few cents. So it's very, very, very attractive here. And I'll give you one example of how easy that is already. So I'm vice dean MBA programs, and I have about a, a team of, of uh, slightly less than 40 staff. And two of my staff are in charge of admission for the MBA program. Now, it's two staff only, but you get thousands and thousands of applications. Yeah. And my staff, so what I did, my entire office, I sent everyone into RPA, robotic process automation courses, analytics courses, Tableau courses. And you may think, oh, this sounds so big. No, these costs are half a day, one day. They're very digestible. And my message to all my staff is, look, you want to do any of these courses, I approve, I fund it uh, for you. And, and it's very important for you to do because why? In five years from now, if you don't know RPA, if you don't know Tableau and so on, it's as if today you don't know Microsoft Word and PowerPoint and Outlook. Yeah. So, so these are skills you have to adopt anyway because you will need them. So why not be a little bit ahead of the curve and you, and, 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 uh, you make yourself such a, such, so much more attractive employee? Yeah. Uh, if you want to go anywhere and you show you've done these projects, you've done these courses, you're very attractive to, to any employer. So, I mean, I really rallied my entire team and I, uh, I can share a bit later if you like. But um, so my admissions team 
they built their own chatbot, which you can look at the NUS MBA website. You can type in any questions about, you know, do I need GMAT? Is there a GMAT waiver? Do you have scholarships? When is the application deadline? What are the fees? When do they have to be paid? You know, all of these kind of questions, they're in the chatbot. And the team never did a chatbot by themselves ever before, but they implemented this. This was now over a year and a half ago. And we have an IBM Watson license at the university. So they use IBM Watson's technology to, to power this bot. And we used our we had FAQs, frequently asked questions before we, we put them into the bot. We soft launched it. And then we launched it properly. And in the first month of the launch, we had 20,000 unique conversations on this bot. So can you imagine I have only two staff and, and, and now suddenly they can talk to 20,000 people and the exciting thing for us is that all the very simple, basic questions, which, by the way, are all on the website, but people like to send an email, they like to ask someone, you know, but how they can ask the bot, um, when's, uh, when is the GMAT uh, um, score due, right? And, and the bot will tell you this. And for my team, number one, much fewer boring questions to handle, number one. And number two, they can really focus their attention on those candidates we really want to see in the program, right? So, I mean, I just want to show you, we call this democratization of intelligent automation. Even people who are not experts can deploy this. And I'm doing this in my entire office now. All, all processes that are boring and repetitive, we look at how can we automate this? So this is NUSC, a small team, because we are talking about SMEs later. I am an SME, if you will. You know, I, I don't have a lot of stuff and we do a lot of these things. And, but on a, on a bigger scale, you look at information services, um, like the information counters in hospitals, in shopping centers, in airports. So here in Singapore, we have the Changi International Airport or Changi Airport. And Changi Airport has an information counter in every terminal and at every level. And that counter is very expensive. Why? I need expensive real estate in the terminal where I could sell Louis Vuitton or something instead. Uh, and it's expensive headcount. Yes, yeah? so I have to pay people. Salaries are high in Singapore, so I have to pay people. Now, and for customers, it's very inconvenient because, hey, this, is, this counter is in the center of the airport, but you may be at the other end of the terminal. Uh, you have to walk a long time before you can ask your question. So I promise in a few years, every 50 meters, there will be a hologram beamed from the ceiling. And this will be attractive ladies and gentlemen in uniforms, uh, speaking all common languages and you know Japanese and Chinese and English and Spanish and Thai and so on. And they can answer all of the simple questions such as where is tax rebate? Where is the Louis Vuitton shop? Where is check-in for Singapore Airlines? You know, so these bots will be able to do this. And the beauty is, I mean, the cost is of course in the development but then the incremental rollout, I can have this in all four terminals at all levels, even in car parks, because the incremental cost of deploying one more hologram here is very little. It's just a beamer, a microphone, a speaker. So for less than $1,000 per installation, I'm in business here. And that is, is really the future. Now, of course, you have, you have these hundreds of digital agents here uh, distributed at the, at the airport. Of course, they're all connected and there is still a control station then at the, ba at the back end here where if the agent gets a question, the, the agent can't answer, there is then one human or two humans in the back end who then through the agent will pick up this question and help that customer and at the same time train that agent further, right? So you will, you will see this will come more and more. And I mean, we mentioned retailing before, even in retailing. You look at today, Samsung is a massive uh, uh, electronics company. Every retail shop has a, uh, in, in electronics has a huge Samsung section in there with, with all of their products. 
And then when you ask a question for what screen you should buy, what television you should buy, at the moment, sales agents, uh, the, the shop assistants may or may not do a good job in explaining it to you. In a few years, Samsung will develop its own virtual agents or digital people, as we call them. And they will be beamed in every shop in front of the Samsung section. And any questions you have, you can engage with the, with, with the agent again in all common languages. And they really are trained in a way that say, if you need to buy a screen for your home office, that with three questions, they know exactly what product that they should recommend to you, right? So these are retail solutions. Now, of course, I mean, there are also there's, there's co competitive implications on that, which means um, currently we differentiate on better customer service. So I'm, I'm better at, at selecting, training, motivating my frontline to deliver great service. But with these solutions, um, they will not be built in-house by companies, but they will be sourced from, from vendors, from external vendors. Yes, as, as will be like ATM machines. No bank differentiates on ATM machines. Banks do not build their own ATM machines. They buy them. And therefore, no bank can differentiate on ATM machines. And I think with a lot of these bots and so on, it will be similar that means it will become more competitive in the service sector and you can expect some consolidation in, in the sector similar to what happened in manufacturing, right? In manufacturing too, we had thousands of car manufacturers and today we have a few left. So that's sort of one, one dimension. Is it, what is the task? Uh, is, is it something physical or is it something digital? And short message, the digital part will really run ahead very, very fast in the, today and the next few years. And the physical robotic part also will come, but will take a few more years. Yeah. So the second dimension really is, is it a cognitive analytical task or a social emotional task? And I mean, for, you can see here, cognitive analytical of almost any complexity in service will be delivered by robots. They are better than people, they are much more cost effective than people and, and, and services will be designed so that robots can deliver. On the other hand, what you have is, um, if the objective of the service is really social, social and emotional, I wanna have fun. I want to enjoy myself. Uh, there's really deep emotions, emotions involved, such as in marriage counseling, PhD supervision. Um, this is really uh, white water rafting. You don't want to go with the robot. You want to go with the person who screams with you, is excited with you, who can feel with you. So this is really, we, we call this the feelings economy. Uh, this is where human jobs will, of course, stay. And then the interesting part is the human robot teamwork. And this really kicks in when you have very complex cognitive analytical work and very complex emotional work. And the best example I can think of here is really healthcare. Um, I'll give you one example. My, my daughter had dengue fever, uh, went back to Singapore. I went, sorry, went from Singapore back to Munich. And um, she thought she had dengue because we are, the whole family had dengue here. But her doctor, she had never seen a dengue case in her whole life before because in Munich and Germany, there is no dengue. Yeah. So, of course, my daughter prompted the doctor and then the doctor did do a blood test and sent it to the Tropical Disease uh, Center for, for, for analysis. And... Um, of course, then it was dengue, and, and then she got her, her treatment. But I promise you in a, in a, in a, in a few uh, that an AI will be able to point you in the right direction, however rare a disease is. So what a, a doctor will do is do the diagnosis with the uh, patient here, go through the symptoms and all of this, and then the AI will, will do a hit list of what are the most common likely diseases here. And then it will show dengue 98% probability. And then the doctor can ask that you have dengue. Really shows how 
AI or intelligent automation can add a lot of value here in these types of services where analytics is involved. And that includes investment decisions, like robo-advisors together with your personal wealth manager, uh, tax consultants, uh, accounting firms, architectural services, right? So in many, many of these services, they're quite complex in terms of analytics and, and, and cognition, but there's also a strong emotional component in there. And, and this is where the human part comes in. And I also promise you in America in 10 years from now, if a general practitioner didn't diagnose an illness that would have been very easily diagnosed with an AI, that this practitioner can be sued for malpractice. So it will become very standard that these kind of jobs will be supported by, by technology. And this was already a few years ago, just to give an example how important that is. This, this, I think it's four or five years ago, they had the world's most uh, uh, um, sort of expert dermatologists trying to identify skin cancer based on photos and, and they competed against an AI. So, and they knew whether these photos of moles of skin patches here, whether this was cancerous or not, because these photos were of patients with a later on were either cleared or it was diagnosed as cancer. And you can guess who, who won, right? The AI beat the world's leading dermatologists. Now, can you imagine what the performance differential will be AI against general practitioners who hardly see skin cancer? Yeah. So you can see the quality improvements that, that will be here. And then even for luxury services, here the Raffles Hotel in Singapore, they, they completely renovated all of their suites and everything. And what they have done is there's the, every, the, every suite has a butler, butler in, in this. It's an all-suite hotel. And yet they really put in a lot of technology here. So I was, was visiting them and I saw, so I'm not, I, in general, I'm not very good with technology. Yes, you give me anything, I can mess it up within minutes. And so they showed me their new iPads. So it's an iPad in the room that controls everything. Aircon, curtains, music, lighting, television. Uh, yeah. And, but it was so intuitive and so simple that I could use all of this. And of course, there's also a very simple button where you can call your butler anytime. And here you have this, the, 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 the personal touch and technology combined here. The butler communicates with you via this iPad, via WeChat, via Linked, uh, via um, um, WhatsApp, via telephone, uh, mobile, whatever. Yeah. So there is a luxury hotel, but even there you can see how they put in a lot of very smart technology. So this is the second dimension: emotional, um, social, and cognitive analytical. The last one really is task. Is that happening a lot or a few times only? And is it is it is it uh, homogeneous or not? So is it each time the same? And you can see if I have a lot of volume of, of, of a certain process or task, and if it's almost the same each time, that's like room service and delivering baggage to the room. This is perfect for robots. Now, on the other hand, if it's very low volume and each time is different, now this is for humans. And I give you one example let's say a handyman in a hotel, right? The handyman has to fix a carpet, open a safe, change light bulbs, uh, fix a piece of furniture. So each time is different. There's no way for the very longest time that a service robot would be able to do that, yeah? And in between you have, um, again, teams. And this is a bit like manufacturing where the robots do the dirty work and the heavy lifting. But the humans are there too, and I mean, you can, I mean, in Japan, hospitals are, are very good with already integrating robots. For example, lifting patients out of beds into wheelchairs and so on. It's very heavy work for the nurses, and here this is perfect to have 
robots that assist. And again, these robots become better, cheaper, faster, almost by the month. So you can really see how this is sort of playing out. And so far, I discussed this as if this here is a, is a physical, tangible, real-world um, action here. But think about this, how this would pan out for information-type, virtual-type processes. And you can see, if I'm a large hotel chain like Accor or Marriott, in every single hotel, I may not have that many, let's say, reservations for the spa. As maybe I have 30 or so. I, it may be not worthwhile for that one hotel to build a bot to, to do spa reservations. But however, across my whole chain, I have tens of thousands of hotels. And at the aggregate level, I can still info, uh, uh, automate these information type processes simply because the volume is so huge. The task each time is very, very similar. So it, of course, it needs some process re-engineering in a sense that I have to make sure it takes Japanese and Chinese and German and English, right? All the languages are there. So the interface has to be the same. But I can offer the same core engine and then put it onto the apps, put it onto the websites, the reservation sites for the spas in every single of my hotels. So what it does, it, it does, you can see this line here for physical, it just shifts it way down to um, at the individual site level. I don't need that many transactions. I, I can aggregate across the entire chain. Now, what we are excited about is to really automate end-to-end -end customer service processes. And I'm always using Google as an example here. How many of you have ever spoken to a Google customer service representative yeah, for your Gmail, for your uh, Google search, for your uh, advertising, for uh, research, uh, for, for, for your Google Scholar, right? Google has many, or, or Google Maps, right? Google has many, many services, but there is no customer service provided, right? Um, it is all automated. And, and Google to me is always sort of the, the best example for what I call is outstanding, excellent customer service that is fully scalable. And Google has a very interesting approach for an investment, there are sort of three questions here. The first one are three principles. The first one is, is the addressable market 1 billion customers? So 1 billion is the addressable market. And the second is the toothbrush uh, test. Do, this, do these 1 billion people need it twice a day? So like Google Maps, Google Search, you use twice a day, right? And the, the, the last one really is the Swiss Army Knife principle meaning one tool for one problem. And, and why? It makes it very simple if I only do one thing with this tool. Right? Microsoft, everything is integrated. A lot of uh, uh, error-prone uh, parts here. And these errors come from developers, from customers, and so on. So this thing crashes a lot. Now, for Google, it's one thing, one thing, one thing only. And you can see why. Because if I have 1 billion customers who use my service twice a day, can you imagine how many customer service reps I would need if I provided email and phone support for this? So they are designed to be so simple and so robust that they don't need customer service. And I think this is the direction the entire service sector will take. You will design your bank services, your insurance service, your telco services, your supply chain services in a way that I don't need customer service anymore. And what I want is really end-to-end -end automation of customer service processes. So I don't want people involved anymore. Yeah, I don't want to go through the details, but you see a smart workflow here. This is an acquisition of a bank uh, for a, a loan product. So everything from customer acquisition, identification, and, and, and uh, um, 
uh, sending the, the money to the customer is fully automated here. So I just want to show you this where we are going, end-to-end -end automation of customer service processes. And you can also see, I, I said is, is, uh, intelligent automation is not one technology. It is all these four capabilities combined with a lot of um, different technologies being used in there. And you can see this beautifully here in, in this chart, how this all comes together. And let me give another example. This is a project Pascal, my co-author, worked on. You, I show you Jamie. Jamie is a digital agent. And um, Jamie serves customers of ANZ banks and, and uh, is completely scalable. She is on any screen, whether it's an iPad, it's a, it's a phone, mobile phone, it's an ATM, it's a website. Jamie can come, come out anywhere. And who knows, maybe soon Jamie will be beamed into the branches as, as a three-dimensional uh, um, digital entity here. So I had a look at Jamie and, and uh, I'd like introduce you to her. I'm really pleased to have helped so many people, but I've only just started my banking journey. I still have so much to learn. We can't believe that it's been three months since we launched Jamie and um, we're really pleased with how she's going. I think customers generally are loving her. She's had well over 12,000 customer conversations. Lots of people ask me how to open an account. She's an evolving piece of work. And so by putting her out into the world, we're able to find out how people are responding to her and what they think and what they want from her. Hi, Jamie. How can I get a new credit card? I can help you order a new credit card. So you met Jamie now, and, and Jamie is really a digi digital entity here. And uh, Jamie is not built by ANZ, it's customized by ANZ, but the company that delivers what they call digital people is called uh, Soul Machines. So Soul, Soul Machines powers um, Jamie here. Now, the book um, that sort of covers intelligent automation here, I just showed it to you and there's a QR code. If you're interested in the book, you can get it from there. There's also a website that gives you a lot more information on intelligent automation. And the other thing I wanted to say is that we here at NUS and my co-authors from all over the world, we have a ton of done a ton of academic research on intelligent automation, service robots, AI, all in the service sector. And you can use this QR code here if you want to see that research is mostly down, uh, downloadable from, from ResearchGate. So with this, let me just say thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you today and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your presentation. It is really fascinating to hear your insights on this topic. Intelligent automation and service robots can release value from operation with greater accuracy, improved customer service and tighter compliance at fraction of the cost. Can you tell us what makes a company, team or project a good fit for adopting these technologies? A very excellent question here. And I would argue, at least in the medium to long term, unless you're really at the luxury end of services, you will have to embrace intelligent automation. It is a bit like um, websites, apps, email. So if you asked 20 years ago, do I need a website? I mean, uh, not everyone necessarily needed it then, but you can see today any serious business, you have to have a website, you have to have email support, chat support, and so on. So I think it would be, be everywhere. And the only parts of the market that may not need to go there is really luxury type of services. So where they have um, uh, customers who really prefer the high touch kind of service. And I always compare this to the goods manufacturing sector here. I mean, leather handbags can be, a lady in a developed country can buy a new leather handbag every month. They're so cheap, they're good quality, they're mass manufactured. But of course, we still have a mass Louis Vuitton where it still costs a lot of money, they're handcrafted for you. And I think the service sector will, and including business schools and education will go in the same sector, there will be the mass manufactured, high quality, large market here. And 
you have to be scalable and, 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 and cost effective. And this is only through AI and intelligent automation. And this would be a massive shake out of players who are not in that space. But then you will have the high end as well, where you have the Ivy League type schools, where it is expensive face-to-face -face education um, that is delivered and people are willing to pay for that. But of course, the mass the, the luxury market will be small compared to the mass market, which will be huge. Yeah. So I mean, my answer here is really, I think everyone will have to go into this. And you think about this, if you are a small restaurant and I still have to call you to make a table reservation that is inconvenient for me as a customer, it is expensive for you as a company because, I mean, you have to answer the telephone. You have to have headcount for that, which costs money and is inconvenient. Or you, you don't answer and you lose reservations, right? Uh, so I believe uh, every there, there are also providers outside, uh, um, third-party providers that offer restaurant reservations as a service. So you just can sign up with your restaurant. So you can see there are many different solutions how intelligent automation will tackle bits and pieces of your service processes that will then be automated. And I mean, dem democratization is, 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 is big here in a sense that you can get a lot of these services already from third-party vendors. So I think it, intelligent automation is, is really for everyone. And, and if you're not in it, you are at risk of becoming extinct. I'm so sorry. Let's start with some success stories. Can you share example of best practices of both large corporations and SMEs in adapting intelligent automation and service robots? The APO have been working hard to support SMEs in our member countries. Excellent question. So my, my heroes are really Google, Amazon, because they deliver scalable service solutions, frictionless. And another company I absolutely love is Wise. Wise is a British fintech and i was so impressed with them uh, they helped me to save hundreds of dollars in, in, in uh, exchange fees and so on compared to my bank in, in germany and within 30 40 seconds i had an account opened with them and i had all the common currencies uh, on the account it is so easy to use and i call this frictionless service here that is fully automated again why is it like google doesn't have operational headcount to serve customers. Products have to be designed in a way that they're so robust, so customer error tolerant that it can be scaled without problems. And that is really the future. Now, SMEs, I like to use maybe my own office here, my MBA programs office as an example. We are part of a large bureaucracy at the National University of Singapore. We have a lot of constraints and still we are any process that happens a lot is boring, is difficult to do, doesn't add much value. We think very hard on how can we possibly automate that? And we have a whole culture built around it. So number one is I sent all my team members to courses, very short courses, um, uh, but they built the capabilities in analytics and RPA and bots and so on as they go. Um, the second thing I did, I started an annual innovation award. So I built a culture around it where people share their stories and they're very proud of these stories and, and they show how they're automated. For example, one thing is we run an executive MBA which where there are people all over the world and we have to regularly invoice and, and, and it's not part of the university invoicing system because we have a different cycle. Yeah. So we had a staff sitting every, I think every other month for a whole day running invoices and, and, and this is very boring and error prone and God knows what, right? And, and so we built a bot to do this here and, and the team members did this and the bot sits on their PC. So, and, and I mentioned that restaurants, reservations, and so on. There are many solutions out there that are plug and play. So if your team is, is um, curious and has a little bit of encouragement and looks out there, you can actually bring in a lot of stuff already from vendors that is plug and play, and, and you can use it, let's say, for example, we, we, we uh, have admission interviews for the MBA program, we have 
I don't know, hundreds of interviews, thousands of interviews even. Can you imagine the scheduling of interviews? <laughs> so if you have a staff member doing email to interview this. So we have an online solution. Now we didn't build it. We just this plug and play online solution to schedule these interviews. So students can pick when they want to have the interview. They can see when there's a free time, which also is a challenge because we have students from all over the world. There are time differences and so on. So we also have to protect our, our staff time a bit that they don't get a call at midnight and so on. Yeah. So now it's self-scheduling. And if you can't make it time, you want to change it or you want to cancel it, it's all self-service. So with this very simple solution, number one, we serve our customers a lot better. And number two, my team doesn't have to work on scheduling interviews anymore, which is boring, time-consuming, low-value add. Yeah. So, I mean, I would encourage build a culture, uh, look a lot more at plug and play solutions that are out there on whether it's scheduling, whether it's appointments, whether it is billing, uh, you name it, right? There are a lot of processes that are very much common across services where you could look for external, low cost, easily available solutions. Although intelligent automation service robots can contribute to higher productivity, many large, well-established organizations have not seen the return on investment they expected. Why do you think that happens and what are the solutions? And I know there is this perception out there that the ROI on robotics and AI investments isn't great, but I would like to contradict this. The... Typical return on investment for, for any intelligent automation is between six months, 11 months, 12 months, rarely does it go all the way to 18 months. So the ROI is very, very fast. And my own experience is, for example, when we put in the scheduling system here, I mean, the ROI was instantaneously, uh, we, we, we spent a little bit of money and immediately we saved hundreds and hundreds of staff hours, um, which would have been wasted on, on managing interview appointments. Yeah. So I, I, I would be very careful so the, to say the investment is not there. Maybe if you do a top-down, massive digitization strategy um, or initiative that doesn't have bottom-up support, then you probably will get problems, right? So you, my experience is you have to go top-down with this big digitization push. But what I'm doing here is for my own team and office, I do bottom up, right? I go into the individual teams and ask them and challenge them, what can you automate? What work can you get rid of? Um, and the ROI, I mean, to, to us, I mean, it's interesting. I don't save money because I don't uh, fire staff. I keep my headcount. But what I do with my headcount now is I deliver a lot more value to my students and to my alumni, uh, something I couldn't do before simply because I didn't have the headcount. Yeah, so we can talk about this separately, but we're having a massive, massive uh, repositioning of our MBA to make it the world's most transformative MBA education experience. And this really means that experiential learning is key. And I need a lot of headcount for that. Where do I get it from, right? So I have to shift staff from boring, low-value adding activities, automate those with intelligent automation, and then shift that staff into higher value adding positions. And that's what we're doing. And while you will not be able to immediately measure the ROI here because I'm not cutting headcount, <laughs> yeah, the quality of service and the positioning overall of, of our programs is really going up and we can see the impact we make on students' lives. When only a few companies adopt intelligent automation and service robots, those technologies definitely differentiate them from the other companies in the same field. However, when their use becomes more common, how can intelligent automation give a competitive advantage? Simply because uh, you're absolutely right that if everyone adopts intelligent automation, it is not a differentiator anymore. It is a hygiene factor. 
And you think about it, if today you have a bank that doesn't have ATMs and forces you to go to the teller to cash money, that bank would be out of business. And I think that exactly the same will happen here with intelligent automation, um, that those who adopt faster will capture market share simply because they will have a more frictionless, a more convenient experience. I mean, for example, I switched certain parts of my financial transactions to fintechs and why they're so much easier to use than the traditional banks. And they're so much cheaper and they're all without customer contact stuff. I mean, uh, let's face it. I don't want to talk to my bank. I only call my bank when I have a problem, often caused by the bank. <laughs> so I don't want to talk to the bank. And the bank doesn't want to talk to me either because talking to me, unless they sell me a mortgage or an investment product, actually costs money. So it, it's very important um, for also for banks and for any service company to cut non-value adding service, both for customers and for the bank. And you're right, in, in the short term, there will be a competitive advantage if you are the first to go and if you have the more intuitive self-service technologies or smart self-service technologies, if you have the more frictionless intelligent automation, uh, then you will, will capture share. But after that, you will have to look for other ways to differentiate your, yourself again. And this is no different from manufacturing, for manufactured goods, where it was a massive consolidation to globally always only a few manufacturers for a few products, right? And in the old days, you had many, many more small workshops and, and, and sort of custom workshops and service is at that stage and that will go away. So if you are a custom workshop, basically, you're in the luxury space and you have to deliver luxury services, the really high-end stuff, which a few people love and are willing to pay for, Everyone else will go to the free or almost free and fully scalable apps, online solutions, fintechs, insurance techs, health techs, and, and, and companies that sort of bundle those and deliver integrated solutions end-to-end -end at great quality, without problems, intuitive, frictionless, and low cost. When companies utilize intelligent automation in service robots, is it better to outsource them or to nurture in-house teams to design and operate them? It will really change how many service businesses operate. And I always like to compare this to ATMs or point of sales equipment. No bank builds their own ATMs and, and hardly any retailer builds their own point of sale equipment. So they buy this from specialized vendors and I think for, for robotics and AI and many of these solutions, you will not build them in-house. Even software, who, who builds their own software solutions anymore today? Right? You, you're getting into big trouble if you do because you have to maintain it and upkeep it and so on. So my prediction is that there will be global vendors of healthcare robotics, healthcare virtual agents, digital agents, digital people. There will be vendors for retail solutions. There will be vendors for banking solutions, for information counter solutions. So there will be companies that specialize on a vertical. And then you as a company, what you can do is, so they develop this, let's say, information counter for airports and they run this as a global business. They sell this to, to airports. And what you can do is, you can design these agents with their uniforms, with their language, with their accents and, and these things. Uh, um, so this kind of stuff, you customize it. But the engine that powers the whole thing, you will buy. And I think everyone will, will, will do that. It, it will not make sense for you to develop these things in-house. So even especially for SMEs. I would really encourage you. There's so much technology out there that can that is plug and play, and you can just pull it in and use it and automate process. There's even RPA software that's available for free. It's freeware, so you don't have to build it. You don't have to buy it. You can just use it. And, and there's more and more coming up. There's so many startups in this place, 
and and they will some of them will become very successful bubble up and become this the global expert on a certain solution in robotics and ai and deliver that at great quality low cost and and your job then as a company is to then use it integrate it and of course you will have to redesign processes products and policies to fit these technological solutions here but I, in general my experience is by doing this they will become better more robust uh, cleaner and and much less error prone finally uh, more advanced technology will emerge over time and contribute to improving service quality but even when companies adopt same set technology their result can be very different is there any silver bullet to guarantee success in using intelligent automation in service robots? I love this final question of our interview here. And I mean the answer is really is there a silver bullet that say to good health? And as you know right no we have to exercise we shouldn't smoke and drink we should eat healthy food we should get sufficient sleep da 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 you don't do any of those things, you can have a massive health problem. You know? And with companies, it is the same. There's not one thing you have to get right. You have to get everything right. I mean, you run out of cash. So, I mean, I always joke a bit uh, because I run executive MBA programs and I have a lot of passionate professors. And these professors will tell you their own subject is the most critical subject in the entire MBA course. So the strategy professor will tell you, if your strategy is wrong, never mind what you do. You will never be successful. The finance professor says, if you run out of cash, you're bankrupt. So your strategy, everything else doesn't matter when you don't have health, when you don't have cash anymore, right? Uh, I say in my services marketing course, look, if your customers are unhappy, so if they don't recommend others, you're never going to be successful. So great service is important. So I tell my students, of course, every professor is right, because if you get their subject wrong, you're in the big, big trouble, right? So it's, it's many things here. And <clears throat> intelligent automation is no different from many other things you do. And it goes back to basics. I mean, number one, what is your value proposition? And this is, I do many I work with many companies, even big MNCs, right? I work with them and I ask them when I come in really, so what is so hot about your product? Tell me in one sentence here why I need to buy that. What is so great about it? And I did the same thing for my MBA programs. When I came in as a vice dean, I was the first vice dean with a marketing background. So I asked all my program management team, so what's so hot about your MBA? And they look at me. And then they think, and then they say, oh, it's a good program. And then they think a bit more, and say, oh, and it's highly ranked. And I told them, look, guys, nobody is going to come to you because you have a good program and because you're highly ranked. An MBA program is like a marriage. You, ideally, you only do it once and with the right partner. So who are you the best for and why? Yeah, so I tell you this here shortly, but it was a two-year journey to identify that what we have is the most transformational MBA education experience in, in Asia. So we really we are a long program, we are a year and a half, but we we change you, we make you the best you want to you can be in your chosen field. So we 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 you have to we have to think get an answer of what is so hot about your product. Why do people love you? That's number one. And number two, I think customer centricity is incredibly, incredibly important. So even when, we, for example, when we developed our value proposition here, I mean, my team was talking and talking. I said, no, look, let's talk to my students. So I asked all of my students, look, guys, you had so many options of MBA programs to go to. Why did you pick NUS? Give me three reasons why you picked NUS. And very simple analysis. So what is the most common reason? And this was really because we had MBA consulting project, launch your transformation boot camps, uh, attachment to uh, 
startups and VCs, uh, internships for credits, MBA case competitions, exchange programs, pro programs with top schools. Over. So the people said, I come to you because you have an amazing overall experience. Um, and yeah, so I mean, listen to your customers on why they come to you. And then the, when they're with you, listen to them on what are the pain points? So what are the weaknesses you have to address? But also listen very carefully to you to what, if you, what are your strengths? What, why do what do people love you for? And why you need to know this is you need to cement your strengths. So, I mean, there's the value proposition, customer centricity. And I think the last one you really have to get is do you, have to, you have to get your customer-centric culture here and, and a supporting culture, especially for AI. Uh, that means uh, make sure people feel safe in their jobs. Don't tell them to automate and then you fire them, right? Or you move them out. Uh, position AI as a way for them to get rid of boring work and get more exciting and interesting work to do. So you, you have to get the supporting uh, culture that helps with this. Then you have to give your team the tools. I mean, I don't force anyone to take an RPA course or to take an analytics course, but I say, look, you know, the money is here on the table. I, I pay for these courses for you. And by the way, they are, tend to be very cheap. A half a day course, $500 or online course, $150. You know, it's rare that I have to spend more than $1,000 for a course for a team member. So I'm very, I'm happy to, to pay and support all of these courses here. And I always say, look, you know, you will make yourself a much more attractive employee within NUS here, but even externally when you want to go. People are so excited when you have done all these courses and certificates. They're on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, and even within NUS, I can promote these people because it's exciting work they have done. They have exciting war stories and achievements to, to share. And they're happy also with the skills they acquire. So, I mean, there was a Harvard dean who once said, I'm, I'm so proud I have the world's most poachable faculty who choose to stay with me. And I tell my team the same. I write you reference letters. You can go anywhere you want. I mean, there, there are no bad feelings. You, you have to take care of your own career first. That's your, your most important thing is your own career. I hope we can deliver, give you an environment here where you can grow and learn, and that's exciting and supportive for you, where you get rewarded for what you do. Uh, but if you decide to leave, I'm very happy to give you your, your, your reference letter, and, 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 I, and I do that. But I say the same thing. We will develop you. We will help you. We will make you successful. And, of course, we hope that you stay. But you can see is, is the, what to, to do uh, to be successful with intelligent automation is not that different with being successful in anything else you want to do. Professor Jochen, thank you very much for sharing your insights on this topic. I hope that many of our viewers will be able to use them to make their business more successful through enhanced productivity. Thank you everyone for watching our P-Talk today. If you would like to receive updates on future APU talks, please subscribe to our APU YouTube channel. I hope that everyone stay healthy and productive. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.